Open your Bibles this morning to Revelation 13. Revelation chapter 13. I want to read through the whole chapter and then we'll talk about it. <clears throat> then I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. And so they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast saying, Who is like the beast who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with a sword must be killed with a sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Verse 11, then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb. And he spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all authority over the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on the right hand and on their foreheads and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here's wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. This is one of those chapters that sort of makes you a little uneasy. You read this and you say, this is such a bleak, uh, outlook, this is such a bleak time when these two uh, beasts come to power. And the good news is, I think for believers, for those that have trusted in Christ, is that I believe we're going to be raptured out before this actually happens. But there are going to be believers on the earth during that time, people that come to, to faith during those days. And it will seem very bleak. Now imagine if you're a first century church, you're, you're one of those seven churches that John originally wrote this letter to. And they get to this section and they read all of this, and, and for a moment they would think, well, how, how is this encouraging? Why is John depressing us like this, talking about these beasts that are going to have their way on the earth? But it all is taken in context. We saw in chapter 12 that this dragon that we know is the devil, Satan, his power, his given power, and 
And in every case, in this dragon, these two beasts, this authority was given to them. It power was granted to them, it says several times. That this is God's plan working out. This isn't the devil having free reign. This is the beast getting to do whatever they see fit. But God allowing these things to happen for His glory and for His purpose. That God's plan is working out. We said several times, and we've heard many other people say it, that things seem like they're falling apart, but in reality they're falling into place. If you go back to 1957, and you could see the, a quote by the Secretary General of NATO. This was a time, and, and really in every age, in every culture, and we find ourselves looking in for this leadership, desiring this this leader that will finally come and make things right. Every election time we, we go, maybe this is the year, maybe this is, and we hear all the promises that things are going to get better, and, and it never changes, does it? And then we, we get to see all the promises broken, we get to see the real person, we get to see the people behind that person, the agenda, and, and what we really never see is the ultimate power behind many of these powers. And this is kind of what we're being shown here. We're kind of being shown the power behind these, um, these nations, these great kingdoms of the world. What was the real power behind these kingdoms? We see the kingdoms of mankind from the very beginning have all been man's attempt to rule himself. Man's attempt to self-rule. I got this, God. I got this. And in and, and every way, whether it's self-rule or whether it's self-rule as a, as a group of men, as a culture, uh, you know, electing a leader, they always fail. Because sin always enters in. Corruption always finds its way in. The Secretary General of NATO in 1957 says, we do not want another committee. We don't want that because we have too many already. What we want is a man of sufficient stature, to hold the alliances of all people and to lift us out of the economic morass into which we are sinking. Send us such a man, be he God or devil, we will receive him. Well, that's kind of telling, isn't it? That's saying it like it is. That we just want someone to lead us. We want to follow someone. And if you don't know the Lord and you don't know the the kingdom of heaven and there's have that citizenship in heaven, then you just got this desire and you don't know what that desire is for. And it it just wants somebody to lead us. And we don't care who you are. And this is the hunger that we see building up in our society today. This is the same thing they felt in those days of those seven churches in the first century. They were suffering over Roman rule. They were they were suffering in persecution. In many ways, they were having difficult time and trying to live a Christian life, always being called to compromise, always paying a price for the Christianity, and like just longing for some, some kingdom, some rule, and they were always just looking for Christ to come and make things right. This first beast, as John begins to talk about this first beast, he, he immediately begins to make a connection to the book of Daniel. In Daniel uh, chapter 7, and you can read the whole chapter later and, and really understand it, but I just pull a couple verses that are pertinent particularly to this passage. In Daniel chapter 7, Daniel was speaking of the four beasts. And these four beasts are, are the great kingdoms of the world. Four examples. Up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by its roots, and there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. And so he speaks of, Daniel speaks of this 
fourth kingdom that is coming, this terrible kingdom, and it was vicious and ruthless, and, and then out of this kingdom would come, arise another uh, king, another ruler that would speak pompous words. And you see that this is, uh, makes this connection to this beast, and we see that in several places. In, in uh, Daniel, those first beasts were, uh, the first three beasts were the lion, which was the picture of Babylon, the Babylonian kingdom. In, in the Babylonian kingdom, in the lion, you see a, a majestic kingdom, a, a kingdom that built and created foundations of a culture that were uh, you know, prominent in architecture and, and many things. And uh, a kingdom had great cities, and this, uh, this lion is, uh, is shown to them as the kingdom of Babylon. And then this next kingdom was the bear who was the Medo-Persian kingdom. And the bear was lopsided, and, which is the Medo, Medes and the Persians. And the Persians overwhelmed the Medes. And the bear was vicious and bloodthirsty for conquest. And then the third kingdom was the leopard. The leopard is a picture of of Greece, of Alexander the Great. He was young, obscure, had this obscure rise to power, and then he conquered swiftly, um, just sweeping across the land and, and really conquering the known world at that time, and he did it all by the time he was 28 years old. These are the three great kings, and then he, then he speaks of that fourth king in the part that we read. Well, John says, uh, he begins to talk about this fourth beast, and he says, this fourth beast is, he was like a leopard. And so he looks at this, and he says these kingdoms in reverse order, strangely enough. And he said he was like the leopard, and so this fourth beast that John is looking at, he says he's kind of like the leopard. Well, how was he like that leopard? So the leopard was Greece, and he was a young leader that rose up in obscurity. He was 20 years old, conquered the world, lived quickly through his conquering. And so maybe we see some aspects of this leopard, of this Alexander the Great type figure in this fourth beast. He said he also had feet that were like the feet of a bear, and the bear was the Medo-Persians. And you say, if he was a leopard, you know, he would move quickly, but if he had feet like a bear, he might be a little slower, but he might be a whole lot more fierce. And the bear was vicious and bloodthirsty for conquest. And then there was a mouth like the mouth of a lion. Mouth of a lion. You imagine the roar of a lion it, that declares power and authority. A mouth of a lion that brings everything, all of creation and all within earshot to attention to listen to that roar, to hear that roar and understand the power behind it. And so John sees this this beast, and he says he's he's um, he's not he's not the leopard, but he's kind of appears like the leopard, a little bit like the bear, and he's and he's kind of like the other one. And it's almost like he's looking at this fourth beast, and it's like a, a culmination of all those kingdoms that came before. He wasn't like an animal; he was called a beast. He called the Roman Empire as if it was like no other. And so, what we see now is almost like this revived uh, a Roman Empire. And you go, where does that come from, this revived Roman Empire? If this fourth beast that Daniel saw was this fourth kingdom was Rome, this, this one with iron teeth that crushed and destroyed it and was ruthless, it devoured and trampled. What happened to Rome? Who conquered Rome? Rome was, Rome was never conquered. Rome sort of broke up. Rome sort of self-imploded. Rome... Uh, was really brought down by its own immorality, by political gridlock, by political corruption, by overspending, by huge economic problems. And you know what they say? One of the number one reasons for the fall of Rome was the rise of Christianity. The rise of Christianity in the culture of Rome. Because it, uh, Christianity opposed all of those things that Christianity became this controlling force that really brought Rome down to its knees, that Rome began to divide up. 
And it makes you wonder if, if Christianity, the rise of Christianity, suppressed this Roman kingdom that brought this kingdom and sort of tamed it, this vicious kingdom that trampled and destroyed. If Christianity is on the decline in these days, if Christianity is pulling back and people of faith are fewer and fewer, does that not give rise to this Roman kingdom that never died? And if that's the case, would we see gross immorality? Would we not see political gridlock and, and, and all of these political corruptions and overspending and economic problems? Would we not see something very similar to that if Christianity, the controlling force, began to decline? And is that not what we see? The rise of this fourth kingdom. And this fourth kingdom is, is a little bit of the first kingdom, a little bit of the second. Looks like it's a little bit of the third. It's resemble these things. And it, it, we sort of kind of come to the idea that maybe this fourth kingdom is kind of a compilation of all the kingdoms. As if this fourth kingdom is sort of the uh, um, compilation and the, maybe the epitome of all of the kingdoms and all of the attempts of mankind trying to rule himself, of men trying to rule over mankind. And of course, each had some success, very limited. The kingdoms were great, but they all fell. They all faltered. They all had corruption and uh, sin and those kinds of things that finally brought them down. And so in, in this kingdom that John speaks of is sort of this what we look at is this rise of this kingdom of Rome once again. And this beast is coming to power. This, this beast <clears throat> is the kingdom, but this beast is also a ruler of this kingdom, this, this antichrist figure. And, and, and it seems as this um, king and this kingdom have those characteristics, and maybe more importantly is it's this, this beast of a kingdom we see in this beast of a ruler that we see over this kingdom is more of a revealing of the power that was over all of the kingdoms of men. The power behind every kingdom and every attempt of man. But there's always this underlying sin and this underlying, uh, you know, Satan just working behind the scenes through sinful men to always pursue their agenda to do what's best for them to, to um, bring about even corruption, bring about the, the, really to break apart the things that might be successful because men put their fingers uh, into the till. Men put their fingers into the power. Men desire power. They desire all of those things. And it sabotages the attempts. So we see this kingdom rise, and he looks very much like the dragon. The dragon being the devil we saw in, in chapter 12, Satan. And we see the power behind these powers, and this beast becomes sort of the front man for the work of the devil. So he looks very much like the dragon. He has seven heads and, and, um, and ten horns. And these seven heads, if you look forward to Revelation 17, 9, it says these seven heads are, are actually seven mountains. And many people see these seven mountains as the seven hills, or the, they see these seven hills of Rome, and they make this connection to uh, the Roman Catholic Church through these seven hills. Uh, but there's every indication that, that these hills are more of a subsequent sort of uh, high places, authorities, uh, I, I want to think of them as almost strongholds across the ages that these, and so this is sort of a, uh, a succession of strongholds and not necessarily uh, seven uh, hills as in a place. But, but there's a lot of opinions on that. Uh, it, it appears there's high places and authorities that's associated with, shown as hills, but it's also spoken of as almost as if it were men. The ten horns of, of this beast are like the ten horns of the dragon. Uh, the ten kings 
uh, sort of shows this picture of ten kings or having authority, ten uh, men of authority and power and vitality. And, and I think it's chapter 17, it says that they don't even have a kingdom yet. They're just kings without a place to rule necessarily. And it's sort of this, they have ten diadems. The beast has ten diadems on his horns, ten crowns on his, um, on his horns. Interestingly enough, the dragon had, had his diadems were on the seven heads. So the dragon is ruling over the seven heads. The beast is ruling over these ten horns. And it's an interesting, uh, interesting concept, interesting thought. He has this blasphemous name that is prominent. and Many would look to, in that culture, this sort of that, that prophetic word towards those seven churches in, in the first century would look to that and say, well, who has this blasphemous name? Who are these examples? And so across the ages, we could always sort of pick people out that said these were antichrist types. And so Domitian was one. He was the emperor of Rome. And, and, and Domitian, he wanted to be called a Lord and God. And so when you address Domitian, you would say, oh, our Lord and our God. Domitian, you are great and awesome and mighty. And, and this was uh, brought about this worship of these Roman Caesars as if they were gods. And, and so temples were set up in that day across um, many of those prominent cities. And as we went through those seven cities, we saw those temples where they, they uh, would, were called to come and worship to Caesar and burn a pinch of incense and hail Caesar as their Lord and their God. And Christians that said, I can't do that, I, I worship one God, uh, it made life difficult for them. And so this, this ultimate beast that's coming, this beast that's yet to be seen, I think there's always been these beasts, John tells us this in uh, 1 John about the Antichrist that have always been, they've always been out there, these sort of Antichrist, which is instead of Jesus, or, or in place of Jesus. And so there's always been those options, those people, those things in our place. And you can look at, you can look like a Hitler and say, to a people in Hitler's uh, time that were hungry, that were starving, that were economy was a disaster, they had the same mindset that that NATO leader said, just give us some man to lead our country. And, and when a man like Hitler stepped up, said, I'll put a chicken in every pot sort of mentality that I'll provide for you and I will, make, I will make Germany great again. People said, we have a leader. We have a man to follow. And became this instead of Christ. And even the church bowed to him. And he used the church to rise to power. Most of the church, not all. Have you guys heard of Emmanuel Macron? He's the French president. He's in a lot of trouble in France right now. But a few years ago, they were all looking at this, this Macron as this guy that's rising to this leadership. And all of Europe was watching this guy. And they had pictures on, uh, I think it was some econ economist magazine or something, of Macron walking on water, proclaiming him like the Messiah over Europe. They thought this guy was their savior. This guy was going to bring them out of this economic morass that they were sinking into. We just want a leader to pull us out of this. And they said... We think that Macron is that. They thought it was Merkel there for a while, but that didn't work out, so they look into Macron. Strangely enough, a guy like Macron rises to power. What's his first name? Emmanuel, which means God with us. In fact, he has like five names. He's like Emmanuel, Jane, Michael, Frederick, Macron. The first four names all are associated with God, the meaning of him. Yet his parents are atheists. You go, what's that about? It's just a strange thing, you know. I don't know that, you know, I'm not calling this guy the, the Antichrist or anything, but I'm saying this is the kind of, of uh, attitude that we are seeing, this call for a leader. We just want somebody. And, and as we see this globalist sort of mindset spread across the earth, we're looking for this globalist leader to step up. And, and you know, it wasn't that long ago we'd say, how's that stuff ever possible? How's that going to happen that there's like one leaders step up. I mean, like, what would happen to the presidency, and what would happen to this, what would happen to that? And we always just thought that that was just the strangest idea. Well, there's nothing strange about it now, is there? 
And we look at that and we say, that could happen like next year or next week even. And so this, this leader, and, and then it says, as this uh, beast, and he was given his power and his authority. And then he, John says, I saw one of his heads in verse 3, one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded. And so one of these heads, one of these seven heads would be uh, mortally wounded. So obviously we're not talking about a seven-headed person. We're talking about seven heads or seven prominent uh, personalities or kings within this sort of this ruling body. But one is going to stand out uh, amongst the others. And this one would be mortally wounded and um, uh, and his deadly wound would be healed. And so you, you sort of see this counterfeit, <clears throat> this counterfeit resurrection. It's almost a, a parody of Christ being, um, being crucified and raised, raised again that this leader would have this deadly wound and that he would be raised again. And what is the response to the world? Uh, they would, they're going to marvel at this. Did you hear, did you see that this man, he was killed and, and he was raised up again and it was amazing and uh, and everybody's going to celebrate this and think this is so cool and they're going to marvel and that they're going to follow him and they're going to say this is our leader this is the answer we have been seeking and in doing so they bow to the dragon they worship the dragon the dragon is worshiped they give their authority they put the dragon as the authority of their life as the beast is worshiped and the cry is, who is, who is like the beast? Who is like the beast and who can make war with him? That's not hard to imagine. Who is like this beast? And again, you see, this is a, this is a mocking of the Scriptures. It's a mocking of God. This is the very thing that was said in the Exodus as the children of Israel, right? I didn't think it was in Moses' song. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you? Glorious in holiness, fearful in praises and doing wonders. Who is like you, God? Several places in Scripture that declaration is made. Who could make war against you, God? And so this declaration is made about the beast as if he were God, as if he is the ultimate and that no one could ever make war with him. But you just got to wait a few more chapters to find out the truth. He's given a mouth. <clears throat> and authority to speak for 42 months. And again, we see this three and a half year. And so this is, fits in this seven year, uh, 70th week of Daniel we spoke of, this seven year tribulation, which the second half will be a great tribulation in time of Jacob's trouble like there has never, ever been before. And he's going to speak great things. Daniel says, as we read earlier, he's going to speak pompous words. Pompous words are boastful words. He's going to boast of himself, even to the point of saying, who is like the Lord? I am. He's going to be boastful in these pompous words. And, then, and he's going to speak blasphemies. But what is blasphemy? But to take the name of the Lord and use it in, a, in an inappropriate way. He's going to take the name of the Lord in some fa fashion or form, or he's going to take Glory for the things that the Lord did in blaspheme the Lord that way. And he's going to blaspheme his name. Which is fascinating because it, it says this beast believes in God. This beast, this Antichrist, believes in Christ and knows Christ and knows God the Father. This beast knows well. The people won't recognize that. He's going to blaspheme a God, a God that He's already convinced so many in the world that does not exist, or they at least want to believe that. And so he's going to blaspheme his name. He's going to blaspheme his tabernacle. And you go, well, you know, when John wrote this, there was no tabernacle, there was no temple. In, in, in John's day, the temple had been destroyed in 70 AD, and so he wrote this in 96 AD. And we know there will be a rebuilt temple in this 70th week. But he doesn't say temple, he says tabernacle. And, and I, I love the, the idea that he used that word tabernacle. And this is John who wrote, the word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us. 
And so if he's going to blaspheme the name of God, and he's going to blaspheme God's tabernacle, I'm wondering if this tabernacle is in reference to Jesus Christ. He tabernacled among us. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And then he's going to blaspheme those who dwell in heaven. Who are those who dwell in heaven? Well, it's God first. It's the, the throne of God in all His glory and all who serve and trust in Him. And, and I believe that it's also a reference to the raptured church that's in heaven. That now that Satan has been cast out of heaven, that he has no access, that the beast and this Antichrist has no access to destroy and make war against the church. That they've been delivered from that, from that work. And so he's granted authority, it said again, the word granted. He's granted authority to war with saints. To create martyrs for the faith. So, so I just said the church was in heaven, right? But as we said, during this, during this time, there's going to be many people that have had enough teaching or had enough understanding to realize they've made a huge mistake and they never received Christ. They were playing a religious game. They thought they knew enough. They thought they were a good enough person or maybe went to church enough times or whatever and they never truly stopped and realized their wretchedness and confessed it to God. Repented of their sins. Turned away from those sins and turned towards Jesus Christ and trusted in the work of the cross saying, that's where my righteousness comes from my Jesus who died for me. Not in my own goodness because there's no good in me. That's hard for a person to come to. And many people are playing a game. And so when you go into this tribulation time, I think there's going to be a lot of people, a lot of churchgoers in the, in the tribulation. I think there's going to be a lot of churchgoers. I think when the rapture happens, there's going to be a lot of people having church the following Sunday. And as the, the things began to play out, I think people are going to begin to see that. And I think there will be a lot of folks come to salvation during that tribulation time. And they will be saints. They will be saved. But they will also be subject to martyrdom, which is a grace. It's, it is a mercy. and it is, it is a grace that God has given them. doesn't sound like it, does it? It is a grace and it is also a deliverance from this time. God granted authority to war with the saints. This beast could make war and create martyrs of those of faith. He's given authority over every tribe, tongue, and nation. So we see this global power that He has becomes this authority over all tribes, all tongues, all nations. And so what we see is that the lines are drawn. There's the earth dwellers and there's the heaven dwellers. Those that are citizens of the kingdom of God and those that are citizens of the kingdom of earth. There are those that follow Christ and those that don't. There's no more middle ground. There's no more waiting and seeing. There's no more playing around. And every indication is that we just draw closer and closer to this time. And then when John says, he who has ears, let him hear. And you go, what else are ears for if they're not to hear. Well, we use our ears as filters sometimes. We use our ears to filter out what we don't want to hear. We, we use our ears for selective hearing to, um, to, to filter out the things that we don't really want to hear because we don't want it to affect our life. We don't want to have to change what we're doing and we don't want to have to get off the throne. Whatever it may be. And this is John saying, the words that Christ used many times, that if you have ears to hear, you need to listen up, is what he's saying. He's saying this is important. And he's given a solemn warning because this time and this beast is near. And he says, if you lead into captivity, you shall go into captivity. And if you, you are killed by the sword, you will be killed by the sword it's kind of a sowing and a reaping thing. And then the idea is that you can't uh, say you're a Christian and be in league with Satan. You can't identify with Christ, but so much resemble the beast. You can't follow the beast and follow the beast's ways. 
You can't follow the power and bow to the power behind the beast for your own flesh and your own desires, but yet with your mouth speak the name of Christ. And he says, here is patience and faith of the saints. I don't think I'm good at either one of those. I know I'm not good at patience. And so we read this and we go, imagine the first century they're reading this and they're, they're already sort of on edge that they're, they're in this difficult circumstance and we feel a little bit of that today, do we not? Well, here's, here's patience and faith for the saints. Here's your opportunity. Congratulations for patience and to grow in faith. says the little children this is what John said in in first John I referred to a minute ago little children it is the last hour and as you have heard that the antichrist is coming even now many antichrists have come by which we know that it is the last hour we know it's the last hour because we see antichrist we see these instead of Christ we see them all over our culture and we go yes if John said it was the last hour, it's the last minute of the last hour, right? And they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that, that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. Well, they went out, it sounds like they went out from the church, from the body of believers, that, that these antichrists were among them. It was in their circle of influence and and, th- and they showed themselves by going out and, and that made manifest that they were never part of us. And so these, instead of Christ, these antichrist figures are right in the midst of the church. Ah, here is patience and here is faith of the saints. That when you see that the sword being used, that you aren't to kill with a sword, to, to pick up the sword is to die by the sword. You, to lead others into captivity to say, well, it won't hurt if we just do a little bit because we want to eat, right? We want to we have a comfortable life, right? God wants us to be happy, right? So if we compromise with the beast, it's not going to be a big deal, right? Because God just, we've been pounded in our heads, right? In modern Christianity has pounded our head that God just loves you and just wants to make you so happy and he just wants you to be comfortable. And that's not what the Bible says. When you take Christ, there's going to be a price. And it's the price of your life. That you pick up your cross. And you die to yourself every day. And if the Lord leads you into that place where you're going to die for him, what greater glory could there be? This takes faith and patience, does it not? Because in our mind, in our flesh, wants to survive, we want to, we feel threatened, we want to flee, we want to fight. This is not what John portrays for those believers. He speaks of another beast. Great, this is what we need. We got, we got a beast. We just need one more beast. How many stinking beasts have we got here? And you see a second beast, and you see this um, sort of, if we think of these as prominent personalities, prominent people in the culture, and leaders, and so we see this Antichrist, and this person is often referred to as the false prophet. And it really begins to look like these uh, a parody of the two witnesses. That the two witnesses were came and they were at the temple and they and they spoke of Christ and they spoke of the things of God and people finally when they killed them they just celebrated it was like such a party and this is almost like a parody having these these two beasts come to power and John is presenting it as if it were that way but when you throw the dragon in there with these two beasts then you start looking at it and you go this has the the, this has the look of an unholy trinity. The devil wants to be like the Father. He wants to sit on the throne so bad. And the beast, he is against Christ. He wants to be an option, a better option than Christ. He is an antichrist. 
He is the instead of Christ. And then this other beast that we're getting ready to, to read about called the frost, false prophet. <clears throat> he really, he, his whole job is to point to the Antichrist, point to the other beast and glorify the beast and, and bring people to worship the other beast and he becomes this type of the Holy Spirit. As the Holy Spirit does towards Jesus. So you see this unholy sort of unholy trinity developing. This beast came up from the earth. We saw the woes in chapter 12, verse 12. Woe to the earth, woe to the sea. And so the first beast came out of the sea, and the sea was often thought about as just this sea of humanity, that somewhere out of this Gentile sea of humanity that this beast rises up out of the sea, sort of out of, out of obscurity, that it didn't come through a succession uh, it wasn't through, you know, some prominence in his name or, or anything else, but he sort of came out of this sea, rose to power out of obscurity. And this one rises out of the earth. And, and, and so, you know, it does, it gives a sort of, again, maybe a parody, a mocking of a resurrection, as if this beast came up out of the earth, came up out of the same earth that Adam was formed from. This beast rises up from the earth and, and he has two horns like a lamb. And it makes you think when this beast, this false prophet comes to power, that he, if he has two horns like a lamb, he's, he's um, associating himself in some way to Christ. The lamb that takes away the sin of the world. Is he trying to portray himself as some sort of lamb? That he would appear is some religious figure that he would try to appear as a lamb. But he's, he, he has a, two horns like a lamb and he has some, something that resembles a lamb, but when he opens his mouth, he speaks like the dragon. He speaks just like the dragon. He speaks like his father. He has words like Satan and, and through his words, his true nature is revealed. Well, is that not the way it is? He may appear very, very lamb-like in his appearance, but when his mouth opens, he speaks like the dragon. This is, this is how so many are deceived, I believe. Because he might appear like the lamb. And if you don't know the Word of God, that th a person like this could speak and have this very lamb-like appearance, and I just care about all you, and I want the best for you. And people go, aw, that's, aw. He's so sweet. He's, he's so nice. I, I just want to follow him. He makes me all warm and give me a little tingle inside. People are going to fall for that craziness. And when he opens his mouth, he's going to say, don't worry about all that Bible stuff, that old, that's just old, outdated stuff. Let me explain it to you. And it'll be all warm. It's all going to seem so innocent and so right. And people are going to go, gosh, this is so... This is what we've been looking for. Somebody that really speaks our language, that really identifies with us and all of our, you know, people used to call it sin, but it's just our way we are. God made us that way. And he makes allowance for all these things that I like. People are going to lap this up. People are going to fall for it because they don't know the Word of God. We can't be those people. The only way we can tell the difference is to know God, to be known by God, to, to hear His Word, to recognize Him by His Word and His ways, to recognize Him by the work that He's done in our life. He speaks like the dragon when He opens His mouth to speak like a dragon. We ought to be saying, time out here. That when someone speaks like the dragon, it ought to send... Alarms going off in our in our spirit. And you should see that today. You should feel it. You should hear it. It's common. The thoughts and the words like the dragon are prominent in our day. The true nature is revealed. The power behind the power is making itself known. More bold every day. More bold. More outspoken. That dragon language is becoming more and more prominent. The second beast has all the authority of the first. And 
over all the nations to make war, to kill the saints, and it has everything that the, that the first beast has. And he was going to cause the nations to worship um, the first beast. Cause the nation to worship the first beast. He's going he's gonna to be doing a work that, that draws people to worship of this beast. And he's going to perform signs and wonders, even fire from heaven. So if the whole warm, squishy, gee, he just really loves me, cares about me thing, fails a little bit, then he just called down fire from heaven, and people go, wow, that is cool. That, I like that, that this guy can do this. And again, just a, a little bit of a false sign, false wonders, and, and really in doing so, you see it's almost a mocking of Pentecost when tongues of fire settled on the people of God as the Holy Spirit came. It's a mocking of an Elijah, a prophet Elijah, that called down fire from heaven with the power of God. It's a mocking of the two witnesses that did the same. In these signs and, that he does, and particularly this one of calling down fire, he deceives many. Again, it says he deceives, he's going to bring such a deception to an unsuspecting people. And then he commands that an image be made to the first beast is really as part of this deception. And this is what we talk about, the imperial worship of the, of the Caesars of the time, that they would, they would put an image within these temples and they would have to go bow before this image. It was funny, I was doing research this last week and I was, it got me thinking about Germany and the way Germany was thinking. And I pulled up a picture and lo and behold, there, were, there was a factory that made little busts of Hitler. And there was just like hundreds of them. And it shows these women making all of these busts. And they were to go in all of the different places in the culture that everybody would have this picture of Hitler, their, their savior, the one that was going to bring Germany to world prominence and, and do this wonderful thing. And it's a very similar thought that they're going to have this image of this, of this one that, that they love so much. And this is what <clears throat> he's going to command an image be made of the first beast. This is going to be a crazy image. This is going to be a high-tech image. I remember many years ago going to, you know, I don't know what year it was, but going to Disney the first time. And I remember going to the Hall of Presidents, you know, and, you, and, and uh, seeing the robotics of the thing, you know. That, at that time, that was pretty cool, you know. And you had this, I'm President Lincoln, you know, they had this robotic movement, and you're going, that is so cool, that is so neat. Well, that's nothing compared to the stuff we see now. Have you seen this deep fake stuff that they're doing on the on the internet that they can take with these computers and they can they can create these videos just like um, the president saying these crazy things and you cannot tell you cannot tell it's fake. It is amazing uh, that um, it, it it'll make you pause when you hear and see things in videos. Is that real or not? And when you see those things happening and then you read this and you go, they, they're going to make it a, an image of this beast. And, and he has granted power to give breath to it, which is kind of interesting because, you know, God is the only one that gives breath of life to men. And so this beast somehow is given life in, in some fashion. And you just, again, I sort of wonder if it's thought of a, what we would call more of a robotic type of thing. He's going to speak and and anyone that refuses to worship the beast, this image of the beast, that the beast would have power to kill them. And you go, this is just, uh, this is just seems so far fetched, but it's not near as far fetched as it was even five years ago. Now you go, I can see this happening. In a world that wants to watch your every move, your every transaction, wants cameras, wants tracking wants to know everything about every one of us and and we can imagine when that day comes when we're all being watched and and uh to keep track of your social scores and figure out just how you're doing if you make a mistake but when it comes time to worship the beast you don't worship the beast you almost feel like it will be at a point that time when some you'd be walking down the street you just disappear you know which i'm kind of thinking that would be cool anyway this one of these days we're walking down the street and the whole church just go be gone be out of here I think that would, uh, I'm ready for that. But in those days when 
there are believers, those that have come to know Christ during this this difficult and dark time. These beasts will <clears throat> be making war against them and um, will call for the whole world to bow. And, and all appearances is that the whole world will bow before them. And uh, this is probably the image that is set up in the midpoint of the seven years in the temple that brings the, uh, uh, that is the abomination that brings desolation to the temple and brings the temple worship to a halt and is probably the worship of this beast within the temple, um, the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. And so then he causes all to receive a mark. And this is probably this, um, this number 666, this scripture is probably, you know, um, all sports uh, things in the last 20 years had somebody in the background with a John 316 with a, ro- with a rainbow wig on, right? And it, he made John 316 the most prominent known Bible verse in all of the world. And the second, or at least the top five, has got to be this 666. Everybody knows about the 666. And that shows up in the strangest places and the strangest ways. And boy, when you sometimes, you know, you're, you're just, um, you, go to, you go to a restaurant, and you, you know, you're waiting on your food, they give you a number, and your number is like 666. You're like, can I have another one? <laughs> you know, it just shows up in strange ways, that uh, places that way, and it just makes us uncomfortable. But... Um, this is not, you know, this is always taken as some like secret code. We just got to figure out, if we could just figure the 666, we're going to figure out the name. But he calls all to receive a mark in some way. Uh, and this mark is to buy and sell. And, and it's either you got to have this mark, you got to have the name of the beast, the number of his name. And it's going to be in your right hand or your forehead, which is really just, um, again, probably not... Uh, a specific, a specific mark, and it may not be a specific mark on your, your hand or your forehead. And, and it really brings the, the thought to Deuteronomy 2, the Shema for me. I, that's what came to mind when I thought about this, that this is on the, the right hand of the forehead. It says in, in Deuteronomy 6.6, 6, um, starting in verse 4 actually, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord with all your, uh, your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And all these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall uh, talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. And you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be in frontlets between your eyes. Well, the Jews sort of took that very literal, and they put little scriptures on their hand and and, uh, on, on their forehead. But the idea is that our thoughts and our work of our hands would become the sign that we that we follow the Lord. That these things become part of who we are. We talk about the Lord. We we live it out by the work of our hands, and everything about our life is relationship with God. And so, if you look at that passage that way, and you go, "What is this mark? What is this seal that the the, the beast wants to put on you?" It is a, a seal of your life that every part of your life is committed towards that beast and, and, and it's a fealty, it's an um, uh, ownership of giving away ownership of your life um, to this beast. And, and, it, and this mark that is very similar to the marking of the 144,000 that we've seen before and we'll see again next week. And so again we see that the lines are drawn we see that um, this 666 becomes this uh, sort of this trinity of the imperfect. If seven is a number of completion and perfection, and we see sevens throughout uh, the scripture, but we also see sevens throughout our creation. There's sevens all around us. There's, it's like the fingerprint of our God, and it's all over our creation. And so this 666 is like this is a number of man it's a it's um it's it's short of any perfection and it sort of becomes this trinity of the imperfect never attaining completion and uh, the completion only available through the lord our god many see this 666 as a reference to nero through um sort of the the hebrew numbers have numerical assignments to them and so you can do some really funny things with that and so 
That's been done to every president, every prominent figure in our culture for the last 50 years, I think, that we keep trying to name the Antichrist. I remember Ronald Wilson Reagan has three, six letters in each of his three names. Obviously, 666, that's the Antichrist, you know. That was one of them that I remember. But you guys probably all remember many others. There have been a lot of them. And so um, I don't think this is some secret code to figure this out but it is pointing to this um, this idea of being sealed towards this beast in this way. Let me wrap up with this verse and I'll run long. This is from Luke 21. But take heed for yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of life, that, that this day would come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the earth. Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass, come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Father, thank you, Lord, 